not that women are inviting these attacks. Am I being too sensitive? Am I an easy target? Do you have to hide yourself in order to do your job? I wouldn't be in the situation if I were a man. Is someone trying to push your buttons as a journalist? Or is someone trying to harass you as a woman? Every brilliant woman and every brilliant female reporter I know has spent too much of their lives second-guessing their first feeling about whether this is a big deal or not. As soon as the question enters your head, it's a big deal. When you're talking about sexual harassment or sexual violence against women, it's not about the sex, it's about men exerting power. Well, there are obviously degrees, but everything unwanted is, is harassment. It's about boundaries and it's about consent. Sources who are sexualizing you when you clearly did not show up there to be sexualized, or bosses who are making you feel like you're supposed to work a certain part of your feminine charms in order to get a piece of information when that may not be an approach that you feel comfortable with. Someone I was working with on the ground in Iraq kept calling me sweetie repeatedly, no matter how much I told him to stop. I'm so sorry, I don't mean it this way. It's just something I say because I like, like somebody and care about them. Like, this is what he'd said to me at the time. And so in his view, it was this kind thing. In my view, it was just diminishing and belittling and frankly, embarrassing um, and unnecessary because I have a name and he's not calling any of the men sweetie. Even somebody commenting on your body and saying, well, you look really fit as a boss of mine used to, I felt that was harassment because it wasn't his job to talk about my physique. Or when he would ask me about who I was sleeping with, like he would say, hey, so what's the bed situation, Matt Loff? My boss liked to take me out for drinks or dinner and tell me, he would tell me rape stories. Oddly enough, women who went out with men that they thought were safe and then ended up raped. And I think I lasted in that job about four or five months and I was just like, I can't do this anymore. This is just too weird and I quit. He started sort of writing me love letters and calling me um, at odd hours. And I needed to maintain this relationship with him because he was sort of central to the story I was working on. So there's the guy sort of talking about how horny he's feeling and you just think like, um, oh. He kept getting in touch and I started getting worried and I told my fixer, I called him and I said, you know, I'm actually kind of freaked out about this guy. He knows where I'm staying. He could easily find out the room I'm in. And my fixer kind of brushed it off and was like, oh, he's, he's a member of the army. Like, it'll be fine. He's not going to do anything. I was talking to Source, and he kept putting his hand on my shoulder, so not anything intimate, and leaning in too close. And then I would back up and sort of wiggle away from his hand. I would consider that sexual harassment. Maybe it was just physical harassment, but it felt sexual. He was just leaning in too close. And what right did he have to touch me? When I first went to Iraq and Afghanistan, I thought so much about security in the conventional terms, like, okay, how am I going to avoid rocket attacks? And where am I going to get my body armor and all of that normal stuff? But honestly, the most unsafe I felt the entire time of being overseas in both war zones was being a woman alone in the tent on the U.S. military base in a climate of almost total impunity um, for sexual uh, assault perpetrators. So I've now learned to plan accordingly. The thing that is really sort of has resonated a lot among our friends after the death of our friend Kim Wall, Swedish reporter who went missing and then murdered while she was um, reporting is that these are all concerns that we were aware of when we talked about and joked about and strategized over. But I kind of feel like it, it took a disembodied torso washing ashore for us to come out and, in public and say that, hey, this is a problem and it's just that this is like the most dramatic manifestation of the, the, the fears and the concerns and the anxieties that we confront on a daily basis. After she was killed in, you know, not in even the most dangerous place she's ever been to, and killed by someone who was well known, um, who I assume she had the, the, the expectation that he would be decent to her, it made me 
rethink a lot about how I do my work, about where I'm willing to meet sources, about who I'm willing to trust, because so much of what we do is placing trust, at least some amount of trust in people we don't know, and trusting that they won't hurt us. Women have another problem, which is we're, we're socially conditioned to please people. So I think we sometimes don't uh, work on our instincts, like this doesn't really feel right, but I don't want to insult him. We just have to remind ourselves that we have a right to be really, really assertive. The time you spend litigating it is time you are distracted from figuring out how to deal with what your system, whether your brain has caught up or not, has identified as a risk. Do not play their game. Do not enter a sort of, you know, flirty kind of uh, mistakenly believing that you can sort of play them at their own game and, and get out of the situation. You have to be very clear about your boundaries, very tough and not give an inch. One of the most wonderful, super simple tools I've ever learned is from my mom, who uh, is a lawyer who's done a lot of collective bargaining. And she has a really simple sentence, and it's, I'm sorry, but that's not going to work for me. And it is this total gem in my back pocket at all these times when I feel need to explain and rationalize. When something feels uncomfortable, just address it head on. I mean, I've never lost that battle. I feel like I've always been upfront, direct, and they're like, whoa, okay, don't mess with her. Very recently, I got a really freaked out phone call from a former student. She was assigned to go with a correspondent, so he wasn't really a supervisor, it was a kind of random thing. And he started coming on to her and telling her how beautiful she was and how he wanted to sleep with her. So what we worked out together, and it eventually was successful, she wrote him a very, very neutral email. If we can just keep our future conversations purely professional so that I can do the best work possible. It's in writing, she can forward it, he knows she can forward it, and he, he backed off at that point. They often teach you in these like anti-rape workshops, they teach you how to say no, and the thing that you're taught is that you're supposed to sort of, you know, with a stentorian voice, say no, and then do the hand gesture, which is great. But most of life happens in the gray area. All of the women, when they had to say loudly no, we all laughed, and we all just giggled. We had these fits of giggles, and we realized how our bodies had not been trained to feel comfortable exerting that particular word in that particular way. And so working through those scenarios in a role-playing fashion was by far the more helpful part of the class, even more helpful than learning how to like jab out someone's eyes or knee them where you need to knee them. You know, we keep learning ways to protect ourselves more. But I mean, how much, how much self-protection do we need to learn before we, we address what is causing us to feel uh, afraid or feel nervous or feel like we're not safe? My advice is don't be alone. Sometimes it's difficult to follow this advice because you have to sometimes go on your own to meet a source. Uh, you have to, you know, if you're doing some undercover work or whatever it might be, because what can you do if you're alone? What can you do? Sometimes I show up early to a location and sort of scope it out. You have to know how you're going to get in and how you're going to get out. Always find a place that's fully illuminated and makes you feel safe. If it's a room full of men, what can I do to bring a woman in there if I'm not feeling comfortable? I'll call and I'll have like room service, like coffee and tea and drinks brought in frequently and I'll be, say like come three times in this hour so that there's constant knocks on the door. If it's feeling somewhat uncomfortable and you're not sure whether you're reading it wrong, just assume you're reading it right and try to shut it down at that point. Don't give them the benefit of the doubt because it could escalate. I don't, on principle, like drop the whole, my husband or my boyfriend or you know any of those sorts of things just because I actually don't like anybody to know about my private life, if that makes sense, so that that's more of like a moral position, but I do think that can be incredibly helpful in these situations, but it's sad that that helps. I usually say, you know, don't, don't go into strange people's homes. If you're in a, a sketchy neighborhood, get out before dark. Um, but on the other hand, I've had students, I had like this one uh, East Indian student, she was about four foot 11. And she ended up lost somewhere in the Bronx one night and she was sitting on a bench crying and somebody came to help her and he turned out to be like the mayor of the neighborhood and that was her source for the rest of her year here. I mean, so I, I'm wary about giving people never 
don't do this or don't do that or never do this because you never know where like that lightning is going to strike and that's the story you'll have. Yeah, what's really heartbreaking is the times when you feel it's shaping and informing the kinds of stories that you can tell or that you feel you can't tell simply because you feel like you don't want to take the risk of going into a scenario that feels really uncomfortable. So there's times when you do give up an incredibly critical source because they've been insistently, consistently sexualizing you and not listening to the messages. You're clearly articulating that you need them to stop. You know, if you leave and you didn't get the interview, you leave and you didn't get the interview, right? And and if you beat yourself up for months because maybe everything would have been fine. Okay, maybe you do beat yourself up for months. You'll figure out how to deal with that, but, but you can figure out how to deal with that because you're alive. So often the people burdened with having the conversation are the ones who are persistently being victimized by this stuff or put through things that make them uncomfortable. And very rarely are the people at the helm of that conversation the people who are perpetrating these kinds of boundary crossings. I think men should um, should talk about how they feel putting women in that situation. What we're asking for, what we need, is a fundamental shift in how men behave and how men relate to women, um, not just in journalism but in general. And I think that you know it's great women are coming out and telling their stories of dealing with these experiences, and we can all connect on that on that basis, but at the same time, we're not the ones who need to change.